I'm supposed to call. Gotta go. Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's time. It is seven o'clock. Uh, you are in the Immortal Universe panel, where we're going to be talking about the Chu and Rice shows, um, interview with the vampire and the Mayfair witches, and I'll uh, have our panelists introduce themselves. I'm Corinne O'Flynn. I'm a USA Today bestselling author of fantasy and history and romance. I have three pen names, and I'm here all weekend. You can uh, find me on the app, and if you guys would all introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Kevin Cafferty. I'm a podcaster and filmmaker. Hi, I'm Hanako Briggs. I am a podcaster of the Sound of Hyper Podcast. I'm, uh, I'm Dina Woods, and my husband and I run a YouTube channel called Drunk and Blurdy, where we get drunk and talky. So. <laughs> <laughs> he can share this one. <laughs> uh, my name's Sarah. Uh, Sarah Rudd. I'm just a general geek. Theater geek, mainly, but geek in general. <laughs> okay, so I have questions for, I didn't know how to structure this since we are talking about two, two programs, so I have a bunch of questions for uh, the Mayfair Witches, and then I have questions that I'm going to go at the second half of the panel for the, um, the vampires. This is interactive, please panelists interject, we're not going to like go down the line if we okay. don't, if like this is a conversation, and if you guys have questions or want to comment, just raise your hand and we'll take them as it happens, okay, so totally cash. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. One of the writers on the Immortal Universe spoke about New Orleans as the least typical American city there is. And another writer said that New Orleans has that incredibly porous feeling in terms of time. What do you think about New Orleans in both of these series? And could these be set in any other place? Oh, no. I don't think so. I, yeah. Um, it, it's interesting because I feel like even though both stories take place around the same time and well in the same city and you know they're kind of related to each other they felt very different to me um, as far as interview like I can't see that story taking place anywhere except for New Orleans it just kind of it felt ingrained in that city Mayfair witches I did not feel the same about it to me, I felt like that could have taken place anywhere. It was just a, a totally different vibe for me. I'm, I'm okay. I absolutely think both of them belong in New Orleans, just based on like the culture of the city and like you know the the mysticism that surrounds it. Plus, I mean, they're both part of the same universe, and I think that that's why they make sense both being in New Orleans. Um, that being said, could Mayfair witches be in New York City? Sh sure, but I think that it would lose some of the like the the magic feel behind it if it was more. On the one hand, I think uh, I, I know we're not supposed to talk too much about the books. We <laughs> might I, I, talk about the books, but we're not talking about the books. Okay, but I I think like oh. the source material that this is based on, the author poured so much of her life yes. and interest in living in that city. I think she, the Mayfair Witch's house is like based on the house she lived in. Um, that the unique, like New Orleans is such a unique American city in terms of like its relation to food, its relation to art and music, uh, as Sarah mentioned, the mysticism, that I think these stories absolutely benefit from that sense of place. On the other hand, we would be spared Harry Hamlin's terrible accent yes. if it was yeah. not set yeah. in New Orleans. <laughs> so, you know, little column A, little column B. Judgy, judgy. <laughs> Sorry, Cher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you think that you're getting the premise that both shows belong in New Orleans because previous shows, such as originals and things that we've seen previously have all taken place in New Orleans and that's just kind of ingrained in what we think witches and vampires and all of that typically just happens in New Orleans like you don't hear about a small city in South Carolina with that happening like right. do you think that we're just ingrained with everything happening not in New Orleans because not necessarily so like I really feel like New York again would be a very good place for a story like this to happen um, so yes uh, the originals uh, did happen in New Orleans. Um, there is a reason for that. Again, the mysticism that that uh, covers that area, like in people's heads at least. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that that's the reason it's consistently part of that. It's kind of like that culture feeling. But that being said, that's not what I feel like this does. Again, I know we're not supposed to talk about the books. You can talk about the books, but we're not talking about the books. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a big part of Anne Rex yeah. um, that putting it anywhere else make fans even matter. <laughs> so let's well, be honest. I, I think I don't think anybody can adapt any of her stories and not have them happen there because it's just like the setting is, is a character in the stories, but yeah. there's such that, that language It is piece. almost a character. It's this like that whole vibe and the, the music and the background. Yes. I think there there could be a play made for having a new fan of that. That's what well, I was yeah. just about yeah. to say. Yeah. You yeah. have to move to another city. Yeah. I think like, Savannah's got or a new characteristics in history. And it's already kind of known for its mystic, crazy movie yeah, stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Then it may be able to be pulled off there. That's exactly they what I was just about to say. They call themselves the most haunted city in the state. So. I mean, you could also make the argument for Salem in the same yeah. same degree. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a lot of those those cities. Plus, you know, both shows have almost like a timelessness feel. I mean, they're definitely are set in a time, but both shows have that kind of like you don't know where where they are, like time they are, like you could stick them anywhere in the storyline. Yeah. So I think that also helps in New Orleans, having that it is that city because it's such has such deep history. Yeah. I don't know if I would go so far as to say like Salem or New York, like you said. Mm -hmm. Um because to me, even though I feel like Mayfair could have taken place in the else, it definitely does have a southern gothic feel to it. Oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, if yeah. not New Orleans, Savannah was going to be my other So I've never been to Savannah. Orleans. Is Savannah physically, architecturally like New Very Orleans? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very I've never been there. And then yeah. they, have a, they have a huge culture where, you know, one of the big attractions for tourists are the ghost rides. Oh. You know, they do ghost tours. Okay. And, they have a very famous uh, cemetery there that you can go through. So okay, so that makes sense. They have some and yeah. I think that oh, I was, gonna say, no, I was gonna say I think that sense of place is important enough that even like I see Nadja is in the audience yeah. that like the what we do in the Shadow Show plays on that by having all of these eternal vampires in Staten Island. Yeah. Like, that's right. part of the joke. Right. Right. Like, um, well, I'm sorry. I'll come back to you. Sorry. Like, you know, I, 
you know, every time that she came on screen, even though she wasn't there very long, like, it was like, I want to know more about this woman, like, kind of, like, where she's coming from. Like, mm -hmm. so, I, I would love to see her again. <laughs> um, as a non-book reader, um, I think what interested me was uh, Cyprian and the, the whole Talamasca, that whole organization, and just trying to, um, <laughs> trying to read through the layers of what they're doing because like with most stories, this is the governing organization or the one that's supposed to be just watching and not participating or not interfering. And then you see as the story moves along in the season, you see that not only are they interfering, they're right. interfering in a major way. Right. So that whole, um, that whole dynamic is interesting to me because it's kind of like, now you just wonder, Cyprian, like, was he just a scapegoat? Was he a way for them to get to Rowan and to try to manipulate what's going to happen with her and with this baby that she ends up having? So it's that, that whole little thing is, is very interesting to me. For me, as someone who thought the Mayfair Witches show was uh, really terrible, Last week. <laughs> um, I thought, like, like I thought uh, Alexander Daddario, who was so good on the White Lotus, and here exhibits the emotional complexity of a potato. Um, so it was hard to it was hard to follow Rowan. But the performance that I loved in the Mayfair Witches, and it's the one performance that I thought like understood the assignment, was Beth Grant as the aunt. Like I thought she, I thought Carlotta was so much fun to watch on that show, so I was like, yes. Um, so I would say her. So you know what's interesting about the books that we're not talking about? The character, and I was reading interviews um, with the writers, in the books, Rowan is a very passive character. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of stuff just happens to her. Right. And they said, we can't tell that story in 2023 that way. We ha she has to have agency. And so I think that they're finding themselves trying to follow the canon or uh, the, the source material and also give her more control over herself, and it, I think that's what you're you're vibing on. Yeah, no, and I agree, agree? with that. I absolutely agree with that. And like, okay, I I, I promise that we're not talking about what we're not talking we about. We don't talk about books. So. <laughs> Sarah, what do you think about the books? I love the book. I am a huge <laughs> book fan. Okay, I I've read them multiple times. When the show came out, I read it both Mayfair, which is and the Vampire Diaries. I, I sat there and I read them all. Whoop, I right? have a daughter named Rowan because of these books. Yeah, search my kids' Maddie. Just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, it, and so I, I do. But you're right. Rowan is very passive, and I do think that they were trying to put that in there. I don't think it's a, the actress is a bad actress, and I am even hesitant to blame the writing. It's just for I me, like I kind of got that that vibe for that that's what they were they were trying to balance yes. from the books and the TV. And I thought that, and when I was asked to do this panel, I started doing some deep dives into interviews and stuff because I wanted to know what was going on in their heads. And, and a couple of times they talked about that how in book uh, season two which is coming, yeah. they are departing more because Rowan is not the person that she is in the books, which is gonna be exciting. You know, so with the story, there's this, you know, whatever. We're not talking about the books. <laughs> um, okay, Cher, let's talk about Cortland. <laughs> what do you guys think about, now you, who, who did not, Hanukkah, you did not read the books? What do you think about Cortland? Let's start with you. I want everyone to chime on, on this one if anybody has any comments. Um, I think if you look in the dictionary for creepy uncle, his picture was just, <laughs> that was just so, his whole vibe, even from the beginning, just, I don't know, he was just so off to But me. he's not really the uncle. Well, yeah. <laughs> Spoiler But I didn't know this until the end. But I mean, but even, even without knowing that, just the way that his whole, um, his whole behavior and his demeanor towards Deirdre, it it presented itself as like doting uncle to you know sheltered niece. But seeing the contrast between him and Carlotta, 
-hmm. and the way that they treated Deirdre, his just came off very weird and it wasn't overly like, oh, I'm a pedophile, oh, I'm this, whatever. <laughs> but it just felt, it felt but. weird. It felt weird to me, I, yeah. but I couldn't place it. It wasn't one of those, like, sometimes when you see characters that have that sort of background, you can kind of see it. And I wasn't sure if that's what well, I was seeing from him. No, well, I, so, I don't believe that his interest in Deirdre was sexual. I think it was about the prophecy. He, it was all about getting her pregnant with Rowan so yeah. that Rowan could be the designee so that he could take the baby and, like, Portland take it Portland was all about <laughs> power. Yeah. That is what Portland was about. It and wasn't that, about sex. It wasn't about having a baby because God knows he probably didn't want to have a baby. Yeah. But it was interesting how they portrayed Carlotta as the villain. Yeah, yeah, hated her, right? Yeah. She gave off such sissy space that carry by her mom. No, 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 oh, mom. not sissy, the yeah, yeah the yeah. mom. But she, it was so, it was so weird. But maybe that was what I was picking up from Cortland, not that it like was Professor like Umbridge. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it was just his whole vibe with her, <laughs> and just I don't know, it was just weird. Okay. I mean, he played it. He played. <laughs> he played it well. He was one of the better characters of the show. I'm kind of and our filmmaker has opinions. Um <laughs> I the the Cortland scenes that I liked the most were the relationship with him and Jojo, his daughter. I I thought that performance was pretty good too actually like I was interested in that character even though she didn't have like a ton to do. Um so like that was when I was most interested in Cortland. Like I, I really like a campy over the top performance but I I think Harry Hamlin missed the mark. You are allowed your wrong opinions. <laughs> I have so many of them. Go <laughs> ahead. I just mainly spent any time watching this show very angry because even though I had read the interview with the Vampire, uh, the Vampire Chronicles like book up to a certain point, I had never read the Made the main trilogy. And when I saw they were doing the show, I was like, well, then I need to go ahead and start reading them. And I made the mistake and was reading the first book while the Freaking show was on, and he I, was like, I just like that just ruined together. every anything I would have loved about the show without reading the book. It just killed all of it. So I don't know. I don't like him. Okay. He's not true. Yeah. <laughs> not, you know, not that he's, not that he's a good character. He's just the, it's just the interesting, is so interesting. The decisions they made with characters because Cyprian is actually a compilation of oh, two Michael. people. Yeah. 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 So it's just interesting to see what they did and why they like. Maybe we'll find out why they did it. But they are. They are very much aware of the fans and the fans' reactions and the conversations that are happening online about it, so that's interesting too. I mean, imagine writing a show about something so beloved as Anne Rice's stuff yeah. and trying to do it right for everybody. Can well, you think and, I, Kevin? and I think one of the things, um, specifically, I guess first about the question, he's a rat bastard, let's just be honest. I mean, he, he's it's all about power, as I said. That's his total motivation. He wants the power. He does it, it's not giving Rowan the power or anyone else, it's about him. Um, and he wants to take advantage of the prophecy. Yes. Um, what is really interesting, specifically about these shows, is when they were first bought, I believe it was by Hulu, uh, it was first just the Vampire Chronicles, and Anne was super involved in discussing it with her fans. And I think that's part of the reason why, like, it went over so well. Because even though she passed before the show came, she was still involved a lot in that development. And so, like, her heart was in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's missing from Mayfair, is, like, her heart isn't in it. Because I, I, if she was involved with it, it would have to be very small. So, that's no, I, you know, I just, like, totally agree. And to be to like to clarify, I am not precious about the books. Like I just don't think the show is good as a show. Like I don't stand alone. I, yeah, I don't care about the Mayfair Witches books. Um, I think Interview with the Vampire show is we'll get to it. But We're I, almost I think there. It's better than the books. <laughs> but that's awesome. Well, my next question is about JoJo. JoJo has seen some things, nice people. Revelations have happened to JoJo. The blindfold has been torn off. What do you think we're going to see from JoJo coming forward? And JoJo is Cortland's daughter. Oh. He's, Anybody I don't know does. how, I don't know. It's going to be very hard because finding out what she found out at the end of the, the, the episode that is the end, and that seeing that her dad is not this guy she thought he was. I don't know. I feel like 
she's going to question her whole family, like the whole situation. And I don't know if she's going to like be on his side to want to do the prophecy though. Like I'm hoping. Do we think Cortland's gone? I don't. He turned into something, but I did not see a dead body. Yeah. I saw somebody yeah. breathing. It's not so hard. I think it was. I, I'm not sure if it was Galt, though. That would be an interesting play, I think. Um, going back to the religious stuff. Yeah, 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 going back to the religious stuff, which we all know and was super, super Very interested in. Like, um, but um, I thought it was some kind of stone, like stone or something like yeah. that. But um, Dodo, I think she could go one of two ways, okay? She could either go, like, she's super supportive of Rowan and she becomes, like, that really good back, or she could end up being villain. <laughs> and, and I think that I'm more leaning towards the villain aspect of it. I'm, but, you know. I don't remember what happens. Like, I don't remember that. Uh, I'm free wheeling on that one. Does anybody else have opinions about JoJo? What we think we're going to see from JoJo going forward? Dylan. Exactly. Dylan? She's Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm thinking the whole okay. time. Like, she's okay. Vegeta. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see. As I said before, the writers have talked about the fact that Rowan was very passive in the books and that they're, they're intentionally taking a departure from that going forward, and we saw that in the finale. Right, and the, at the end of the finale, when, when she was being very protective and using her magic to be like hands off. Right. Um, what do you think we're going to see going forward now, since we're in uncharted territory for Rowan's character? Because can I talk about the books that we're not supposed to talk about? Does anybody not know what happens in the books? Well, the baby is not supposed to be a baby for any length of time, mm -hmm. and the baby grows up. And kidnaps her in the books. That's not, it can't happen. Yeah. So I wonder what we see coming. I you don't. What do you want? What do you want? Go ahead. Yeah. What do you want? Okay. Well, Rowan. Okay. I, as a book lover, would love to see the king in heaven, but I know that can't happen. So as far as Rowan goes, I would like to see her. Like the more developed as a character, I would like to see her become more confident about herself and her powers. You know, I would like to see her like rebel because we kind of saw that in the first thing. Like, I'm gonna rebel beyond this prophecy, beyond my expectations. Like, I want to see her do that, and we kind of saw that at the end where she was becoming her own. I would like to see it more of that. I think it's weird because. In the whole, the whole book of Lasher, like, it's just, she's pretty much a victim through the whole book. Right, which is what so they said that I they don't can't know do. How they're yeah. going to make that, make her less of a victim with that storyline? I don't know. I, I don't think that. they're going to follow it. Is yes, the thing. Exactly. I don't know how they can, but I don't know that they're really supposed to depart completely. And you know, and I know a lot of writers of books talk about selling the rights to productions, and then they release their hold. And they say, here's this thing I created. Like, um, Diana Gabaldon talks about this with the Outlander. Uh, here's this thing that I created and I've given it to these people and now they're gonna make something new. Right. And we as fans have to allow for that. Like we have to kind of give them the space to do the things because those books are old. Mm -hmm. Like the times hey, have changed. Don't say that. They I, have, are I have a daughter named I'm after her already. already. Oh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself. <laughs> no, but like, like, the, time, the times have changed. Like, we are not the same people that we were when those books came yeah. out. And so the TV audiences are not the same. They will not accept those types of character lines. So it's just interesting to see. So going back to that, because I actually I'm was sorry, about Joe and I didn't, because I know it was appropriate or not. But we were talking about JoJo, and I kind of don't want JoJo to be the villain. I don't want the trans person in the show who's got actually getting to play right to, get to be the villain. Yeah. I don't want that. Like. You know, well, I don't want her what to like be something that has to be a well, character. But, but a villain from whose point of view? Like, what if? So, like, we all think we were all shown that Carlotta was evil and doing all she's horrible, horrible person, and then we realized she's just trying to protect the yeah. hell out of her family's legacy. And so she was doing it all the right way, but she's got like fruit face, and so she looks like she's just gonna rip people's faces off. You know, what if JoJo was trying to 
protect legacy in a different way because she was never in the line for designee and like all those things. Like what if it comes off as villain simply because it's against Rowan or maybe against Lasher, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know. But I guess well, it's just I don't a know way if anything going against Lasher wouldn't be would be considered villain, but yeah. you go ahead. But no, I was gonna say I, I think um, the intent it, it depends on the intent because yeah, Carlotta was doing this to protect her family, but there's something about drugging someone to the point where yeah. they can't do anything and keeping them that way for twenty something years. Yeah. That to me speaks villain. Oh, I don't yeah. care what yeah. your yeah. Yeah. Car Carlotta's road to hell was paved with good intentions. Yeah. Like when she yes. put the necklace on the other woman and she kept yeah. herself oh in the basement. Right? She yeah. tried to like Ooh. kill Rowan with a knife and burn the house to like I don't know. That, well, these don't, these well, don't so things I, seem I, like I things like that are good. She her intentions were good when she was younger but yeah. I think at a certain point growing up and knowing the history and knowing what was going to happen and then feeling like she had to protect her family she did it by any well necessary. the psychosis the normal shifts you know normal is now yeah. here oh like the, what's this over here yeah. let's bring that in school family like, oh let's just murder them so they can't be a part of this practice yeah. Like, yeah yeah now well and sometimes with Carlotta I almost felt like I, and maybe I'm wrong. I kind of got that air of like jealousy also mm -hmm. in it. Like, like it, it just seemed kind of like in the back, like jealous of Deidre. Like, yeah. And jealous, like I'm, I'm not the designee, yeah. but I want to be. Well, that's kind of like we, and I didn't have a question about it because I wanted to give equal time, but we do have a couple more minutes to talk about the show, Tessa. Like. Here we have the entire family trying to protect everybody from Lesher and all the machinations of all the things that we're doing for a generation to protect everybody from Lesher and then given the opportunity, Tessa and her mother like, me, take me. Like, what do we think about that? Tessa. <laughs> I did not like what they did with that. Tessa, unfortunately, I, I understand. And I understand like she was like the sacrificial lamb. Okay, to get Rowan to wake up. Okay, that that's what I thought Tessa as. But it didn't make sense. Because they all knew what Lasher was. Like, now, was he powerful? Did he provide power? Don't tell me that out of all those families that they didn't know about the prophecy, or at least had some kind of idea as to what was going on. So why Tessa constantly be like, why won't you talk to me? Why won't you? You know why he won't talk to you. He's supposed to be with Rowan. I'm sorry. You go ahead. No, you're fine. No, I'm through. Yeah, no, it's all good. We're all like, yup, yup, yup. It is interesting. I thought I was really surprised when we were gonna take when we did the circle and they were gonna like Rowan was giving up the designee status that they were actually going to be giving it to somebody else. I thought they were going to try to like break it and make it not a thing. And yeah. I was like, wait, what? Like we're going to award it we'll to say. somebody? But once yeah. you realize that, it was obvious that they were going to pick Tessa. Yeah. yeah. But it's also that because of having a legacy mean riches and prosperity and all these right, things. Right, because the Nessie owns everything. Really yeah. They didn't really care about the fact that this kid it's just a demon. It's just a demon. And they also have to think, so Tessa wanted she wanted Lasher because she was yeah. trying to fight against the, the witch hunter. Uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> okay. also, I, we have I, found the line where we can't talk about it. But <laughs> also, it could be that Tessa and her mother, you always you always have the one person. Like, everybody knows what the bad thing is. You can be taught from birth. You always have the one person who's like, <laughs> yeah, I think you might be exaggerating I think I want a little, little bit. bit of that. And I think that's kind of what they they made Tessa and her mother out to be like, yeah, I know you guys say he is really bad, but is he? Is he? Maybe yeah. not. You know, and I, I just think right. kind of felt like that's what it was. Okay. Like, they just really, because they weren't witness to what Rowan went through or what Deirdre went through, like, this is all something, especially with Deirdre, because she's in a catatonic state for most of the time, most of what we see happening is happening in her head. So that this is not something they actually witness. So it could be that they're just like, oh, you guys are just over exaggerating. Yeah. Oh, you guys are Enough trying to be greedy. Yeah. You're trying to keep the riches and the glory and the power for yourself, and you're not sharing. So I kind of felt that vibe from them. Okay. Did you have anything to add? 
the Tessa character felt to me like the writers had had a young person described to them in very great detail, yet had never actually met a young person. <laughs> and then we're told, write a young person. Well, there's a character that's in the series that they, that, that they have, I'm pretty sure is, what they, is why they did yeah. Tessa, yeah. but it's not like the character's more not important character's than right, right. Tessa. And yeah. yeah, it's interesting. You know, I hope that we are rewarded for our lenience. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Nice thing. Yes. Yes. Her mom kind of reminded me of the girl in high school that was like, he's the star quarterback, and yeah, he beats his girlfriend, but it's her fault. It's, he's going to be better with me. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I can control yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm special. Yeah. I'm special. Okay. Ding. It is time to talk about Interview with the Vampire. There we go. Yay! Yay! Our long national nightmare is over. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Can we talk about the casting? Yes. Can we yes. talk about, Ooh. like, has there been a more perfectly cast show? You know, I'm not sure if you think you are coming out through the microphone, but you're not. I'm not? No, you're not. Only you. These speakers aren't working outside. Oh. Check one, two. Check Hello. one, two. Can you hear me now? Just get closer yeah. and talk a Okay, then you need to talk into a microphone as well. Okay. 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 Thank you. Is that better? Sorry. Uh, yeah, we can't really hear that up here. Um, yeah. So, what do you guys think about the casting choice? And and not only, but also, casting Louis as a black man and not a white plantation owner. Oh, I got a lot to say. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the one. So the biggest thing is uh, when I first heard that Louis was gonna be black, I was like, oh my god. You know, but then I was like, hold up, <laughs> New York plantation owner, and I know that there are black plantation owners, don't get me wrong, there are history stuff about that, but I was just like, first off, I don't want to see Louis, you know, have slave people out, like, I'm sorry, I don't want to see that again, I saw that in 94, I know that's like the original story because of the time period, but I don't want to see that again, so I was very happy that they put it in like the 20s. But then they turn around and make him Keep a pimp. Keep the <laughs> They made, made him a pimp. And then I was like, first off, do y'all not know <laughs> the history of these things, guys? Like, black exploitation, you know, that's a period of time where all we wear are pimps and hoes. Can you not make him a pimp? But then I said, okay, slavery, immoral, kind of, you know, human trafficking, pimping. Immoral, human trafficking. It is the equivalent. Like, yeah. I, no, I don't have nothing against sex workers if you're out there. Nothing that just, but pimping is usually bad. Usually pimps are bad. <laughs> and I didn't want to have like this character be this, but then I was like, well, Louis was a slave owner, so. Oh, right. Um, but that, so otherwise, I got over it. So I got over it real quick, also because Jacob Anderson is fine. Uh, <laughs> I, was gonna say, he really good I was like, great worm. <laughs> the glow up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, that was my for my initial like to pool and and stuff. But um, yeah, I'm very happy. But that was short lived, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> After that first episode, I was happy like a speaking like a bitch now. I was like, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> okay. So number one, I loved the casting. Like you know, I I am all about racially blind casting. There is no reason you needed. I am a theater kid, <laughs> yes I am. Uh, I, I admitted that at the beginning of the panel. But uh, I'm all about relationally buying Cassie. So I personally think that was amazing, an, an amazing choice and it provided more diversity in a story that needed more diversity. Yes. Um, that being said, I under, understand completely about what you're saying about the pimp. Like I agree, thinking about it now, now my initial reaction to it was, him trying finding something that was available to him okay at the time to give him power that the white man would not let him have and so that is why like i was i was okay with that i would much rather see him as a pimp than see him as a slave owner right I and they did, the they writers did. did discuss that. The writers talked about, like, yeah. we had to kind of stay historically accurate in what would be available to a black man who was also a successful business owner. Exactly. And, you know, owning a brothel is not the same thing as 
literally handing the girls over. It's a little bit, a little they bit kind different. of talk about the line there, but without going down those lines. But like, I thought it was an interesting choice. Oh, no. Cause that's even something um, Rowan Jones said. Oh, sorry. Ronald Jones said that specifically, like, uh, I can't make this man <laughs> right, play <can't>. <laughs> Yeah, but you also can't give him a white man's business because the part of the problem with his character's story is that he, no matter how successful he is, he will not be allowed in those halls. Yeah, you know, if they wanted to make it so that they didn't have to give him, like, kind of this, like, bad guy job, they would have had to age it up even more than they currently did and it right. would work for the story. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. I think the casting added so many layers to the show and I also feel like for this show to work at all, um, whoever they cast as Louis and the staff needed screen chemistry together and oh, 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 to burn up the screen. Um, and I know the, the book always had like a very strong gay subtext and I think okay. making yes. that subtext text was like the smartest Bringing thing it the out show was, did. Yeah. Especially because it's, you know, it's 2023 now. Yeah. And I think, and then it, it allowed other things in the show to be the subtext and I, I thought that was like I so great. And like, you know, I, I know we're off Maver Witches, but one of the reasons that show didn't work is because Lasher did not have screen chemistry with Alexander Daria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, I've read a lot of Reddits about that. Yeah, and you have a question? Yeah, about... I, I had a comment about the uh, Simpsons because mm -hmm. my initial response was also, oh, they made the black man of Oh, but also from a vampire metaphor, I feel like it makes a sort of sense that yes, it's very much like uh, the vampire is living off of other people's bodies and the flavor. Oh, of interesting. Living off did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I also love uh, Sam Reed is just the star. Oh, yeah. And it really helps that he's a fan. Like, he loves Sam Reed's books. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing I want to say is, uh, I cannot wait to see Asad be fully our mom. Yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. God. So I, I was just waiting for that reveal. Like, yeah. the whole time, it's like, yeah. it's got to be a mom. It's got to be a mom, right? <laughs> I, I also yeah. think it's hilarious. <laughs> I also think it's hilarious, like how Anne Rice was so vocally anti fan fiction for so long. Like, this is the like most slash fictiony show come to life television show ever made. And, and the other thing uh, about Anne Rice is how anti sex she was. What? Like the useless organ. Like you never. That was the comment constantly made in the Vampire Chronicles is the, the useless organ. Yes, there was sexuality, but you didn't see the vampires. Well, she was Catholic. Yeah, I, oh, I understand that. But she also but, wrote like, the, like the sleeping body. All she, over she wrote the erotica. Yeah, but, <laughs> she wrote some BDSM. The Sleeping yeah. Beauty yeah. series. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm talking about specifically in, for the, the like she talked con yes. consistently about not having the vampires have sex, sex on the screen, yeah. and it's all it's all over this, and it works so well. And it's it's just so sensual, like it doesn't it doesn't feel gratuitous. Oh, no, and that and I think that's why it works really well because yeah, it wasn't forced. she yeah, yeah. yeah. it yeah. in her writing. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, um, uh, I actually am trying not to go down a different rabbit hole based on based on that comment um, because I I personally as someone who's ace actually liked. Not. They weren't sexless, but the actual act of it, and there was a certain choice made in the show that was, I think, a direct result of them adding sex to Claudia's character specifically, and it's one of the reasons why I liked that there was not sex in the original books, because it took away a potential source of violence, yes. Yes. specifically non-male not like characters, that, yeah. Yeah. that unfortunately has been added back in, but I will not go down that whole rabbit hole because I got opinions. But as far as casting is concerned, because that's what we're talking about. Love it, love all the casting. I personally feel like all of the, most of the choices made based on casting, time period, aging up Claudia, um, making us, us, uh, you know, casting Assad as Armand has all been in line with the spirit of the characters and their arc, changing the time period, changing the, everything with their greater arcs, not just the ones we saw in season one, but their larger arcs. And one of the things being a pimp, it was actually portrayed with him having remorse. Yeah. Right. Yes. 
it's addressed. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. As a negative thing. Yeah. Right. And yeah. as far as far as the uh, sex, the, I do remember because I remember when this got announced again in Hulu, and Anne created a Facebook page to talk to her fans about like casting and like um, ideas for like based on different shows and and stuff like that. And she did talk about the sex aspect, and she said that there would be there would be sex. Okay. So for vampires to be a power fantasy, if they're if they're not exactly violence, that can happen. When you go exactly, yeah. and she said there was just there wasn't a way to do it. She just and I and I I would not be able to find her comments now because they're buried in years worth of posts. But she uh, she basically said that yes, there would be sex in the the show, but that she would make sure that it wasn't just about the act. So, in that way. That's also part of the reason why she never put the, oh shit, sorry. <laughs> part of the reason why she never put the sex in there was because of the time period she wrote the books. It would not fly that these two gay vampires were like <laughs> boning in her books. So she was just like, yeah, we're going to put subtext and we're going to make it romantic and then you know, people like this. Right, and, and as that, a result, yeah. we got such sensual yeah. Yeah. Like the books. I mean, come on, some of the stuff is they so good. Do. <laughs> okay, so this is a modern. Oops, excuse me. Yeah. I also just wanted to touch that I was happy that Daniel was actually a character outside of like Queen of the Day. Also, <laughs> yeah. the fact that he got to be like, I, I love Daniel Malloy, and I, I'm so happy that he's like fully fleshed out. Um, I wonder, with that being old, if there if he is the one that's going to be doing body piece. Yeah. Oh my yeah, god, that's, that's gonna be awesome. Right. Yeah. We just have to wait and see. Yeah. I'm holding out for the Mem Knock the Devil. Mem Knock the Devil. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is a modern redo of the old story. And they, what do you think about how they brought the story into modern time without deleting the past? Because they had the tapes from the earlier time that they did the interview. What do you guys think about how they did that? I thought that was well, really yeah, clever. That was really well done. Like, yep. like really well done. Like, you, they didn't try to, as you said, they didn't delete the past. Like, it was very obvious that, like, Louis had already talked to, to Daniel. And, right. I mean, obviously, again, talking about what we don't talk about, there are some differences with that character in particular yeah. that um, may obviously aren't going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, they did it really well in the fact that they brought, they used the tape as like that first entrance into the show. Like, it's one of the first things you see, and it just makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Bless you. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it made that character more interesting, not having him be this kind of wide eyed innocent. And it, it provided like more tension with his interactions with Louis. Like, these two had had a history. And as someone who had like lived a life and age and had done something that Louis can't do, it provided like more regret on Louis' side. I, I thought it again, like like again, I felt it was a really smart adaptation choice, and it showed that it's full of really smart adaptation choices. Yeah, and then they burn the tapes so that we can't revisit what he said before. It's only what Daniel remembers, and he keeps calling him out. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that was the thing I loved about it because it's like you you have this this person, even though Louis is giving his version of the truth now, when it's contradicting what he said before, Daniel was very right. quick, quick to right. call him out on this mm -hmm. bullshit, like, hold up. Right. Like, which one no, is right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and well, he's like, well, they're both right. Like, now yeah. I'm retelling my beautiful story. <laughs> like, because the, that's the thing about it, like, with Louis, after you read Vampire Lestat, after reading Interview, you're like, Louis lied about so much <laughs> <laughs> Either that, or, or was not lying. Lying. Or she changed her mind right. about Lestat she when she the loved song. the vampire Lestat. Like, she wanted him to be this this pure asshole, but then all of a sudden she's like, no, he's the hero of the story. And so, based on that, I think it's really cool the way they did it, because it kind of like, because, you know, in the books, he like, it went on to be an actual, like, novel that was printed, and right. it was out, on, you know, in the, in the, you know, in the ether, people had it. Versus these tapes, nobody has ever heard them yet. So it's like they can right. start all over again and do new stuff. And so I think that that 
you know, that's part of it. And it allows us then to use Daniel as someone who's like, well, that's not what you said last time. Wait a minute. And I wonder if that's the reason why, it was one of my next questions, is that why Armand is hidden? Because Daniel knows who Armand is because he's heard this whole story before. Is that why we didn't know that he was Rashid? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they hinted at it. Okay, let's be honest. Oh, I know. Like, like, I mean, we kept, know. We're not supposed to know, but our fans and books, we, we had a pretty good idea that that was going to be our mom. Um, I did want to say one thing I loved about the tape. Yeah. Well, is it almost threw back to the movie because at the end of the movie, he takes tapes. <laughs> yeah. So I love that we saw that. Like, it was almost like a little call out to the original movie. Yeah. yeah. Did anybody have? Yeah. Um, no, I, I really like. into 
anything new and shiny and especially something that makes their lives so much better. It isn't, we, we physically see her, we don't physically see her grow up, but we mentally see her grow up. And I think, you know, she has more time to cope with what she is. She has two people, even if one of them is kind of a narcissistic asshole and the other one is, uh, you know, hates himself. Okay, and, and so, what else would Claudia do? Like it just, it makes, it makes too much sense to me. As far as Louie goes, he's Louie. <laughs> see, I think in the book you see Claudia mentally grow up and I think one of the interesting things the show does to comment on the mortality is because Claudia is turned as an adolescent, like mo like adolescents, like they're mature about some things, they're not mature about other things. And I find the Claudia character is like that throughout. It's like she's trapped in this adolescent state no matter how much time passes, and like what a nightmare that is for both Louis and Lestat and for Claudia, that she's never gonna progress. And I think all of the immortal characters in this show, like time moves on and they stay the same and none of them can get past their bullshit. And I think that's one of the themes of this show, um, which is why when you see Louis talking to Daniel, uh, you see that Daniel has changed. And I think um, that's one of the ways that this show uh, is like that's, I think changing changing Claudia to an adolescent I think is another way that it improves on this story yeah. and it also like if you cast a child and you're making multiple seasons like that child is going to visibly age and yeah that's true too from a movie from a TV production yes. point of view which segues so beautifully into my next question so I wrote down my note was mortality can be as much of a cage as immortality can be so I have a two-part question what do you think about our power characters in both of these series having terminal or very near terminal illnesses? Cortland has ALS and Malloy has Parkinson's. And what do you think this means for them as far as either their motivations or their decisions or what we're gonna see from them in this series going forward? Okay, I was gonna let somebody else talk first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so. When it comes to terminal illness, it that person that personally hits me different, just because I, you know, especially after 2020, but even before that, I I deal it dealt with a lot of terminal illness in my own life, like not necessarily me, but people around me. So I can't help but think about it in terms of the people around them and what that's going to mean for them. So. As far as Daniel goes, you know, I, I, I can't spoil things. <laughs> Daniel, I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure we're going to see him much in mm -hmm. season two. Okay, I think we'll either see him die or he'll go back and try to spend time with his daughters and, and do that. I think, I think, you know, he's, he's terminal. Court, Courtland, his ALS, I always saw as you reap what you sow, and this is the universe's way okay. of getting back at him, <laughs> okay, for being buttheads. Anyway, that's why. I had a question back there and I forgot to oh, come back to you. Uh, no, I had a comment and it's kind of long though. So I'm sorry. sorry. Illness, um, power. I don't know because again, I I don't know what happens in the books. I can only go by. We're what, only talking about yeah, the show. Yeah, we're only talking about the show. So, for Daniel's character, I don't know. I think one of the things about his illness is it makes it like there's a certainty when you know that you are sick where. I think you take a little bit of the blinders off or you take a little bit of the filter off and you you will say things or do things that you're not too much worried about the consequence because of, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I'm already dying, you know, um, let me just be honest. And um, I don't know, I think that's dangerous for him in the situation that he's in because now you, you've got this non-filter 
with these two vampires and one that you Deadly just creatures like yeah. yeah and especially one who just revealed himself to you and it's like when you when he realized who it was, he was it was like one of those oh i've met you before why didn't i remember that i met you before so i feel like there's something dangerous in his term, terminal illness that may affect him i don't know if he's you know i think um louis mentioned something about his illness and it was one of those things where i was like okay is he gonna offer to cure him right mm -hmm. and if so like how will that you know work out um I, I don't know because i feel like that would be the easy way out or that's the expected um outcome i don't know if i feel like they will go that route yeah um as far as portland i have no clue i'm i'm just kind of like i, I would say this for for mayfair which is I'm just along for the ride now because I've watched the first season, but I kind of feel the way Kevin did about that <gasps> show. Yeah, I, I'm so <sighs> sorry. That show, it's, it's like, if you were going to put the shows out, they probably should have done Mayfair first and then interview, but I feel like if they had done Mayfair first, they wouldn't have brought the people Nobody, nobody yeah. would have watched it. It is a deeper they show. Been, yeah, it is a deeper so. show. I think it I think it ups the stakes for Daniel in terms of like you know if if you take the dark gift then you will be cured of this horrible progressive disease and then you can't judge me anymore yes um, and I so I think it, it works there because it, again it, it ups the stakes because Bogosian's not that old um, in the bad show it just the ALS just is out there like a vestigial tail for no reason <laughs> Right. So we're talking about mortality and death and how because it's the one thing he has to world. bring to him. The, the dying mortal man is chronicling the suicide of the immortal man. It's oh, an interesting parallel. Well said. Okay, this brings me to my final question. You are offered the dark gift right now. Do you take it? Why? Yes or no? And why? Kevin, you have 10 seconds to answer. Uh, I'd say probably not because I those none of them seem to be having a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I think I would. Just yeah. because I I mean, I would like to see the turn of the century. I would like to see how things change and progress and I don't know, I just think it would be interesting to not have to worry about money or health or I'm with any you. Of that. So, I'd say yes. Yeah. As a recovering Catholic, I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of vampires in the audience. <laughs> yes, definitely, yes. Ever since I was like five. <laughs> it's been a dream. Same, I'm same still working five. on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say yes as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> He's you know, rolling his eyes over here. <laughs> I love you, Kevin. Uh, we're just on another panel together. Uh, but the... Uh, no, I'm gonna say yes as well. Um, in it's purely actually kind of going back to that last question about terminal illness and stuff. Uh, the idea of not having to live with that pain, that pain that that's really what would appeal to me. And especially when you when you take in context this universe of vampires, humanity is still alive. <laughs> Right. Okay. So you can retain at least part of your humanity while also being immortal. That's not such a bad idea to me. Okay. Show of hands. Who would say yes? And who would say no? Any undecideds? I'm laughing at no, this question because it's like, yeah, no. I don't think I could hold the cable. No. I don't. I don't want to do it. My question was like, on this, like, have you thought about like your loved ones and stuff? Right. You were talking about like the pain of loss and stuff yeah. like that. Like, right, because it's a different okay kind of loss. Say goodbye oh, okay. to but you also have the aspect of 
there's always somebody else there. That's true. I mean, yeah. like, there's always the next generation. And, um, and I, again, I am terrible with names, um, but from the books, there's that, uh, I can't remember her All name, and she's not in the series, but there is that aspect of, yeah. of that. Well, and also, like, if I've lost a child, like, part of me feels like I look forward to the time when we reconnect in whatever form that, if that ever happens, and you give that kind of, like, that's a real, it's not like you give that up. If that happens. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I was gonna say, um, as far as loss, like we experience loss without being immortal. That's true. You know, so it's kind of like give you more time to heal. I just think a lot of people don't think about that. The, we don't. The aspect of the change. Well, and that's Louis. Louis is struggling yeah. with that. He's watching his family change. And his mother getting yeah. old and dying. So let's look at everything. Why do they do what they do? Why it's being do? lonely. Yeah. Why do they always want they're companionship? Alone. Yeah, they're alone. They're alone. So that falls back into like losing our loved ones, right? So if you're constantly chasing not being alone, then you're kind of in your own velvet prison if you choose to be anymore, right? Yeah. You're in your velvet prison because you're always trying to find something the next best thing. So you're not. But you do the same thing when you're alive. But I can I can kick the bucket at any moment. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like you, we have YOLO. Hashtag YOLO. Unless I'm right. standing, right. standing, right. standing, right. standing, right. standing right. in the sunlight on a rooftop, then yeah, maybe. maybe. But that's a little painful. When you're immortal, but. you always have the opportunity to escape that. But what if they don't want it? What if they don't yeah. want it? Right. You know what I mean? What if the other people don't want it with me? Which is I was gonna bring that up because I had a plan. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a I was like, you know what? Okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna bite my husband, bring him over. It's, we're gonna just be together. You know. We're wait, 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 wait. No consent. Hey, what if he didn't want it? What if he didn't want it? That's what I'm saying. If I bit her, she'd be like, oh, wait, I'm just going to let all I asked him, and he said, all I can give you is a werewolf. And I'm still like, the way your husband said that is important to know to end up werewolf. Thank you so much. You guys were at the time. I appreciate all of your cooperation. And I'm sorry if I missed anybody's question. Thank you.